So welcome to the Red Couch this morning. And my very special guest is my brother by another mother, Mr. Ronald Boo Hickson. And my first question for you, Boo, is I'm going to ask you about your early childhood. What was early childhood like for Ronald Boo Hickson? Um, Vic, that was pretty unique in St. Lucia because as you know, I started playing my music very young. My mother taught me to play the guitar. Um, so, the two tones, I started pretty much when I was at school, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of things happened for me very early as a little boy. And I wasn't quite aware of what was happening because um, it would be a holiday here in St. Lucia. Or rather, it would be a holiday in St. Vincent, for instance. And not a holiday here. And I'd be invited to St. Vincent to perform for the weekend. So, these guys would charter a plane to get me to St. Vincent on a Friday afternoon for school. I'd go with my homework. Perform in St. Vincent. This is why you're at school? Yeah. So, perform in St. Vincent um, on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And they fly me back early Monday morning to go to school and fly me back Monday afternoon after school to perform in St. because Monday is a holiday in St. not a holiday here. So there was I as a little boy flying charter but not even understanding the level I was already operating at. But prior to my, my, my playing the guitar, my, my mother taught me. I, I just knew I wanted to be a musician because I'd get a lot of bottles, monkey bottles, bumbo bottles, fill them with water, and create a skill, you know, and um, just play them and play music on these bottles. So that was the thing. Was in you from early. But from before we go on, I have to tell you also, mm -hmm. when we lived on, on, in town in Broadway Street, man, there used to be a guy walking past my house every night with a guitar around his neck, singing and playing his guitar, walking up the street, and he used to be drunk every night. A street troubadour, basically. Street troubadour. But drunk. And Vic, I want to be like this guy. Not drunk. <laughs> Not drunk, but I never saw him as a drunk. You know what I'm saying? I never saw him as a drunk. I never saw him as an alcoholic. You saw him as a musician. I just saw him as a musician, and I wanted to be like this guy. And, and it tells you that in everybody, there's some good. You know what I'm saying? There's some good in everybody because I would watch this guy every night going to the street. I said, boy, I wonder if I'd ever, ever be able to do that. And I still admire this guy. And then, as I got older and I reflected, I said to myself, boy, boom, it's good that you never saw this guy as a drunk you know? and that you just saw him as a musician that could inspire you. And so that, that taught me a lot of lessons in life, not to judge. Not to judge. Okay. I want to talk to you, Boo, about family life. Now, having known you now for over 40 years and probably closer to 50, um, I happen to know that you come from a family that have all been really overachievers. So I wanted to ask you, how exactly did this all evolve from, a, from, from one family, all of these overachievers? Mommy was a bit of a, a soldier, you know? So, whatever she, my mother beat me at 21 years old, you know? <laughs> <laughs> And when I tried to talk up, she said, said to me, shut up, I'm your mother. Shut up, shut up, I'm your mother. And that drove the point home. So, but I must also tell you that, that um, I think, I think what we got was a lot of discipline and a lot of um, guidance because mommy, she read a lot, she used to read a lot, she had a lot of wisdom and um, we, all, we all benefited from that wisdom and so that, um, the achievements we, 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 we managed to accomplish is not something we did on our own. That comes from the discipline and um, everything that was instilled in us by our mother. 
Tell me about this part of your life where your health and fitness became such an integral part of who you are. Well, I, I believe you are what you eat. It's an old adage, but, but it's, it's true. You know? So I don't eat junk. I don't eat junk. I don't drink any alcohol. I don't smoke. I don't eat canned foods. I don't eat meat. I don't drink water from plastic bottles. I don't eat sugar. I have not eaten meat in well over 50 years. You know? And that's about the same amount of time I have not drunk alcohol or smoked or eaten canned foods. You know? And um, I think that contributes to the way I look at my age. You know? um, I think one's health is something you have to take very seriously. You, know? you cannot, you cannot um, indulge in things that you know that are going to be detrimental to, to your health. You just don't do it. <laughs> but but I, I have to tell you also that I am, I'm extremely disciplined. If there's something I decide I'm not going to do, I'm just no, there's nothing in the world I can make me do. I want to talk to my brother Ronald Buhinkson about his years with the True Tones band. But there's a story about me that I want you to leave out though. <laughs> <laughs> I used to get together with a friend of mine called Michael Alexander, whose father was the chief, chief justice of Nigeria. And we used to just jam together. And then another friend joined us. And one day, Carlos Mins, who was the bandmaster, the police bandmaster, called and says, well, boom. I have a gig with the police band, but I have a performance to do with my band at the club called Gage. And I'm wondering if you all can hold on for us until I finish my performance with the police band. I said, but we're not a band, we just some young guys who know a few songs. Mm -hmm. He said, no, you can do it, man. I said, but we don't even have a name. He said, well, call yourself the True Tones. Mm -hmm. Just come and play. Let's play. <laughs> and when I finish my performance with the police band, I will come and take over. And that is what happened. That is the, the, the genesis of the whole thing. When I, when I left school, my mother said to me, Boom, you cannot just leave school and be a professional musician in solution because nobody has done that before. In any case, you need to go find an 8 to 4 job. <coughs> so you need to develop some work ethics and understand what it is to be disciplined in a job. You go to work at 8, you go to lunch at 12 o'clock, you're at 1 o'clock, work until 4 o'clock. And to please my mother was a soldier. I had to go. So I went to work in government for a while. And I sat there and writing a lot of songs <laughs> while I was working in government. And Vic, one day, I just said to them, listen, man, I think I'm leaving this job today. I'm going to play my music. Vic, at a time, nobody in St. Lucia had become a professional musician, nobody. But what I knew was that we were in the embryonic stage of, stages of the tourism industry. And I knew the industry would have to develop and the tourism industry would have given me work. But anyway, we used to come to West Indies Records to record, and then um, West Indies Records had some ongoing negotiations with, I think it was Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. So, because of that, my music got into America. And when it was the 30th Super Bowl, I got a call saying that there was going to be a Caribbean halftime show. And if I would be interested in being part of that halftime show, I said, if I would be interested in it, that's a question to ask. <laughs> so this is how we ended up um, being part of that halftime, 13 support halftime show. And that stemmed from being invested in these records who had an, on, an ongoing deal with Warner, Warner Brothers. Brothers. And that got my music into America. Ronald Bohinkson, my very special guest, on the red couch, here at his home in St. Lucia, overlooking Rodney Bay and Pigeon Island, where we'll all be later this evening. Thank you very much for a fabulous interview, Ronald Bohinkson.